Hello, and welcome to our second Wilson Institute Speaker Series, Self-Isolation Edition. I hope you're all well, a few updates. As you can tell, my hair is still growing like a weed. Essentially, I've decided to embrace the 90s indie kid mop top and run with it. My kids still eat too many snacks. However, because of all the Zoom meetings I've been having, the novelty has finally worn off and they no longer feel the need to invade my screen whenever I try to do something like this. Today, I thought we'd try something a little different. Instead of a more traditional one-person talk like I did last time, I thought we'd give this whole interview thing a try. So, if you dig this and you want to be interviewed by some dank interviewer like yours truly, send me a shout. It's my pleasure today to welcome Cassandra Lucic, a very good friend of the Wilson Institute, and Nicole Mary Burton, who will surely also become a very good friend of the Wilson Institute. Cassandra, for those who don't know her, is a PhD candidate in the Department of History at the University of Toronto. Her work explores how changing notions of Canadian citizenship interacted with ethnic identity during the Cold War. More importantly, in the summer of 2018, Cassandra was the winner of the very first Corsini Fellowship in Canadian History at the Wilson Institute and spent two wonderful, life-changing, and amazing months at the Wilson Institute. Nicole Mary Burton is a comic book and children's book illustrator, an activist, and a founding member of the Ad Astra Comics Publishing Collective that specializes in comics with a social justice theme. She's published The Best, Making a Living on the Dying Planet, The Boy Who Walked Backwards, and a chapter in the Wilson Book Prize winning Drawn to Change Graphic Histories of Working Class Struggle. Today we're going to discuss her new graphic novel, Enemy Alien, A True Story of Life Behind Barbed Wire, which was published very recently this past month. The graphic novel tells the story of Canada's first national internment operations through the eyes of John Voychuk, an internee held in Kapuska Singh from 1914 to 1917. And now, without further ado, let's go. Hi, Cass. Hi, Nicole. Uh, thanks for taking the time to, to talk to me and talk, talk to us today. Um, thanks for having should we, <laughs> should, we, uh, should we just get it out of the way right now and talk about the thing that every one of us can't stop thinking about? I mean, I know, you know, it's the one thing I can't stop thinking about. It's surrounded, you know, like it's it's taken over our entire lives. I mean, for myself, I've been thinking about it for like over like a couple of like for over a month now. I mean, every morning I wake up, it's just like the pressure of it, you know, like the weight of it, just kind of like, you know, it's all we keep thinking about. So I'll just throw it out there and get it out of the way early. And um, that is Cass, when are you going to finally bring me those Polish donuts you've been promising me? <laughs> A lot of turns. That, uh, that wasn't where I was expecting that to go. Um, as soon as quarantine's over, I promise, first thing I do is uh, <laughs> polish donuts and bring them to your doorstep. Promise. But so seriously, no. Seriously, no. I, I hope you're all well and that you're staying safe. And again, thanks for accepting my invitation to, to be a part of our uh, self-quarantine speaker series, um, self-quarantine edition. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, your new book, in, uh, Enemy Alien, A True Story of Life Behind Barbed Wire, which was published last month. And I can see that you have a copy behind you, uh, behind your cast. Uh, so, and yes, and, and Nicole as well. Um, so generally speaking, your graphic novel tells the story of Canada's first national internment operations through the eyes of um, John Boychuk who was an internee in uh, Kapuska Singh from 1914 to 1917. Cass, can you tell us a little bit more about your book and what really what, it, what it's about? Yeah, um, so the book's based on uh, a memoir that I, I found in an archive that I was working in, so it's a true story. Um, and it tells the story of John Wojciech, like you mentioned, who uh, was a Ukrainian immigrant uh, who in December 1914 is picked up by the police and sent to an internment camp in campus casing, Ontario. Um, and again, right, like you, like you mentioned, Boychuk's arrest and his subsequent incarceration is part of this uh, larger story of Canada's first national internment operations when the Canadian state uh, cracked down on so-called enemy aliens, which uh, for Boychuk was a title that he earned because he carried an Austro-Hungarian passport. Um, so the book details the daily life of internees, everything from moments of resistance to boredom to extreme exploitation. Um, and then in 1970, Boychuk is paroled and released 
into the custody of the Dominion Steel and Coal Corporation or DOSCO. And the book follows him to Nova Scotia where he's forced to work in the mines until 1923. And then the book ends uh, in 1945 when Wojciech actually returns to campus casing and reflects rather aptly um, on what this all sort of means. Um, and yeah, so, so it ends with this kind of really powerful contemplation about uh, what it means to be an immigrant in Canada um, and who's, who's coming up against this like very extremely and irrationally xenophobic society, what it means to be a migrant worker who's essentially engaged in slave labor, uh, what the impact of this was on Ukrainian community consciousness and particularly the socio-cultural and political makeup of the community. And lastly, how this historical moment um, stains yet is really quite emblematic of liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. And just to, sp to speak really quickly as to why uh, John Boychuk I think it was because that I recognized um, that the memoir could flesh out these bigger picture themes while also telling a really good, compelling story. Uh, and there are very few other internment sources that I think can do this. Like we don't really have any other comprehensive firsthand accounts. So this was just this kind of perfect opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And, uh, and the next question is for basically both of you. So why did you choose the graphic novel route and for those of us who are really interested in potentially publishing a graphic novel, what was the process like? So when I came across the memoir, I was actually working on an academic piece on internment. And for that piece, I really tried to like squeeze out everything that I could from the memoir. But I still felt like I could do more with it because like I said, it was this kind of perfect balance between the bigger picture and a good story. So I wanted it out there in its entirety. Um, and I think this is a... Um, this is a, a problem that a lot of historians actually come across with sources like this um, that are really fascinating, but that get diluted because of the constraints of academic writing and publishing, or that simply never get told because there's no uh, long form space for things that might be perceived as like anecdote, right? Um, and this is why I encourage everyone uh, to take their sources like this and to call up Nicole and to do a graphic <laughs> But yeah, I think I really wanted uh, to sort of like get it out there in a way that it might reach most people uh, possible, right? I wanted it in the hands of folks who don't know anything about internment um, and who want to just very quickly and easily get the five W's or the Coles notes of the story. I wanted young people to read this who for a variety of very valid reasons might not want to pick up a 400 page book. Um, and I really also wanted it to reach my community, right, the Ukrainian community, um, so that we could continue to to both promote this injustice, but also um, to remind us how things once were for Ukrainians in Canada so that we can now presently show um, solidarity with today's victims of xenophobia and racism. Um, and by the way, there is a uh, Ukrainian version of the book coming out soon for, for the Ukrainian community. I wanted to just sort of speak to the, um, the unique quality of uh, comics. So um, obviously most people understand just sort of the basic anatomy of a comic book and that doesn't necessarily change when we're talking about graphic histories or comic scholarship. Um, but the synthesis of image and text is really important. And I think that um, when we're talking about um, turning history into comics, there are a lot of really exciting things that you can do. So um, in the instance of Enemy Alien, uh, you know, having somebody's own words is um, just such a valuable thing. That was something that made uh, Cole Mountain also um, a real pleasure to work on. I was able to conduct some interviews with a, a woman who is now in her 90s, but was a child during the miners' strike. And um, her stories uh, really were such an important supplement, um, especially considering the um, political controversies of the strike, you know, like um, the written word was either um, extremely uh, pro-striker and kind of like written in a way that was like dressed in romanticism, which I, I wanted to, that, I felt like that was nice, but also I wanted, I wanted the hard facts. <laughs> um, and then on the flip side of that, I had like newspaper clippings from the time that were like awful, like horribly anti-worker and like made fun of the fact that workers were being beaten by the police. And, you know, so in the midst of that, I have this woman, Grace, telling the story of like coming home and seeing her piano teacher having been beaten by scabs, you know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it was just a really powerful addition to a story that I felt was otherwise 
uh, lacking in a lot of details and a lot of kind of like human components. Um, so the human component actually is one of the things that I think the comic can really do for history. And that really comes through when you have a powerful narrative like Cass found with John Wojciech. Mm, I mean, yeah, the example of, of your graphic novel, but also uh, Draw the Change. I mean, we absolutely adored those two books. And maybe if, maybe you can walk us through, a little bit through the process. So say someone, you know, like a, a, a hist an academic historian has a really, like, really cool, really unique, you know, like episode of, the, of, of our past that would make a really interesting graphic novel. So how would, like, you know, I understand the manuscript process, I understand the journal article process, but man, like, I, I don't understand at all the graphic novel, you know, like aspect. I can't even draw like a stick figure to save my life. So how would, how would, <laughs> you know, like how would an academic like myself would go, how would I get to that point of, you know, publishing um, a graphic novel? Right. Yeah, sorry, I got caught up in why comics and didn't explain the process at all. Um, yeah, I definitely, if we want to open up a comic and look at the anatomy, um, there are a few core components that have to do with those the aspects of text and visuals that I was talking about. Um, first step that I would highly recommend is getting a script writer. Um, so a big difference between writing for, say, an academic journal and um, writing something like a comic book is that a comic book is actually more like a script for a play or a movie or a TV show. Um, and that is um, like an actual legit profession that people uh, spend a lot of time honing in on. Um, so uh, that's the first step. You start with a script, um, and hopefully that script is keeping in mind what's going to work in terms of wording, what's going to work in terms of visuals, although an artist will usually come up with their own ideas about what could be a really powerful visual after they've read a script. Mm. Um, after that, you're, you're getting into the initial visualization, so that is usually drawn up as a storyboard. I think a lot of people have started to see and are familiar with storyboards now that you know, you can like watch the bonus footage on a Pixar movie or something. You know, it's just like the little sketches that show you like the pace of the narrative as it's going and gives you a sense of like, okay, well, what's the, what's the perspective in this image? And, you know, what's the expression on somebody's face? How many people are in this frame? Um, and once all that starts to get laid out, um, you can move to kind of like more fleshed out uh, illustrations which are usually um, just sort of like light pencil work to begin and then it just keeps getting added to and added to and added to you add inks you add color um, you'll add like your official text placement and then it'll all get laid out and I mean depending on how a comic is going to be published um, you may have like different levels of editorial jumping in to kind of like give different feedback um, so I think in the instance of Enemy Alien, uh, we, we were putting together edits like up towards <laughs> almost the 11th hour and a part of that was we wanted it to be as historically accurate as possible. Um, and that kind of thing, sometimes you just like don't notice something until, you know, the very end. Kath, I think it was you that was like, um, we had bayonets on some of the guns and it turned out that there weren't bayonets on the guns. but um, I kept uploading files and like stray bayonets would be coming in from old files and so we would like keep finding bayonets where there weren't supposed to be bayonets. I don't know. I don't know if that's of interest to anybody, but it was, it was just one of those things where we wanted it to be as accurate as possible and so the revisions kept going. Um, but uh, yeah, it can be a really exciting process seeing it all to come together. I know it can be really hard to visualize mm -hmm. a comic. Um, before it's in front of you. Hmm. Um, but uh, it really is kind of like a back and forth dialectic process in a way where you, you, you try to, you do your best to visualize something and hmm. then you see it and hmm. then you have a reaction and you can process it and you can come up with something better for the next step. So hmm. that's kind of how comics works when hmm. you're working as a team. And, uh, you know, looking at your, Nicole, looking at your past experience, you, you, you seem to be, you seem to enjoy working with, with historians and, and history. So really, what, what, what appeals you so much about, about history? 
I'm not trained as a historian, but I, I do very much love history. I love popular history. Um, I've always felt like history was uh, an obvious place to tell good stories. Um, so when I was in high school, I read a lot of Howard Zinn and I was really drawn to things like People's History of the United States, which felt like just really good storytelling. And I, in a lot of ways, I was like, wow, this is such an incredible story. Why don't more people just know about it for its like literary quality, you know? Um, in terms of working with historians, I mean, I find that good historians know how to tell good stories. Um, and I'm also, as an artist, just delighted to be working with people who are mostly just concerned about things being historically accurate, <laughs> and then they leave the creative work to me. <laughs> that's just that's just my honest answer, because um, I I do I do care about that kind of stuff, and and oftentimes as the non-historian in the room, I don't necessarily have an eye for it. So. <laughs> um... So obviously, you know, like as much as I was joking a little earlier, you know, in our in our in our conversation, um, you know, about you know, we 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 can't ignore what's happening, you know, beyond our walls. We're living in these ridiculously crazy times, um, and you know, like your book is really relevant, um, you know, to, to some of the current conversations that are happening in Canada right now, um, especially those regarding uh, the federal government potentially invoking um, the Emergencies Act. And I mean, one of the one of the really awesome elements about your book, and that really stands out, um, is that it provides a really good example of the dangers of giving our government these extraordinary powers. And in the case of your book, I'm referring to the War Measures Act, which in 1988 becomes the Emergencies Act. And you know, by giving you know like government these like sweeping powers, you know, to basically censor publications and jail citizens and and dispose of private property. Your book, en Enemy Alien, shows that th that had like a like a tremendous and negative personal impact on on the lives of 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 these people just because they were happened to be born under like the wrong empire. So in the you know like in in the anxious times that we're living in, you know like we're starting to hear more and more the calls to give these powers to the government, you know, the, with the fear of, you know, like, the, you know, like COVID-19 and, and as a result of the, you know, the increasing amount of cases, increasing amount of deaths, you know, we're starting to see in the media, but also in the public, you know, like these calls to invoke the Emergencies Act. So what lesson do you think your book can tell Canadians about giving our government, you know, this type of authority? Yeah, um, so I, I think you're right. Um, but before I talk about specifically the War Measures Act, uh, I kind of want to offer a few more like benign examples of how the book might inform this current conversation that I, I think, you know. So the first thing um, is that the, the Spanish flu actually makes its way into the internment camps in 1918. And it does so because of censorship and restriction of information, which was obviously very common during the First World War. And likewise was this uh, kind of common symptom of, of martial law. Mm -hmm. uh, while the upper echelons of the army uh, knew what was going on, those on the ground, internees and guards alike, had no idea what was coming. Um, so in campus casing, uh, the epidemic actually arrives via uh, three guards who were like very visibly sick, but who the government had no problem shipping off to the camps because they didn't want to sort of like do anything out of the ordinary or draw attention. Um, and so they, they get to campus casing and one dies basically as soon as he gets off the train. Um, and the other guards realizing what's happening immediately try to isolate the other two and like flatten the curve as we would say now. Um, it's too late, of course, and the whole camp eventually gets uh, sick. And the book talks about how um, in, in uh, November 1918, 17 internees die in the span of eight days from the Spanish flu, which I would argue is, is the direct result of these kinds of policies. Um, and the really sad part uh, is that the war ends the same month, right, on November 11th. So it kills them right as the possibility of their freedom becomes a reality, right? Um, and to be clear, I think uh, the, the Canadian government is, isn't doing a a bad job at conveying information uh, to us today. That's certainly not the case everywhere in the world. Um, but nevertheless, I think this is a really good reminder of the importance of open communication between a government and, and its citizens. 
the second thing that I uh, would want to mention um, is is on the lines of, of feelings of like boredom and restlessness and isolation and anxiety. Um, of course, there's no uh, comparison between uh, what's going on today and the experiences of, of internees. Um, but there is a small point to be made about how we might respond to these these kinds of feelings and sentiments. Um, by and large, internees didn't cope well with their incarceration um, and their reactions sort of ran the gamut from anger to more um, distressing responses like self-harm and sometimes um, even suicide. Uh, not always, but but usually these feelings could be mitigated through things that today we call like self-care um, uh, and through community, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. so I think lesson that that we can learn from them is is a to take care of ourselves as best as we possibly can and b to try to support and take care of each other uh, and especially those in our communities today who, who are, are being put in harm's way in order to heal us and feed us and so on mm. um, but yeah to answer your questions about your question about emergency um, powers in the state a, a few quick things mm. the first is that um, in times of crisis the Canadian state has shown us over and over again, uh, that it will scapegoat the most desperate and vulnerable members of society first. Mm -hmm. And it's really important that we're conscious of that as we live through another moment of crisis um, and that we don't allow for this to happen any more than it already has. And the second thing, um, so it, it's kind of funny, right? When, when I teach about the First World War and the War Measures Act specifically, students are often shocked at how subtle the implementation of martial law is. Um, it doesn't happen all at once, uh, nor is it always obvious that it's happening. Um, and there also tends to be this, it kind of moves slowly, right? There's a lag between when the government gives itself these powers and when things like conscription, political repression, and internment start to actually happen. Um, and this can create the illusion, I think, um, that martial law isn't all that serious or that nothing's going to change because those kinds of like tangible markers that make clear that something, you know, isn't right aren't necessarily there compared to, you know, if we want to compare that to bomb raids during the Cold War, which obviously indicated that things were not normal, right? That isn't always the case with, with the implementation of martial law. So the point is that it's important to stay vigilant uh, because usually by the time that the consequences of martial law are explicit, it's already too late. Mm. Um, and, and again, right, by, by no means is, is this an argument uh, against social distancing or quarantine or lockdowns even. Um, it's vitally important that we listen to healthcare professionals and that we ignore politicians who want to put the economy before our health. Um, all I'm saying is that we, we do have to be cognizant of, of how martial law materializes and also how it's used. Um, and perhaps more importantly, uh, we have to remind ourselves that that while state power is absolute on paper, it, it can be checked. Mm -hmm. So what's next for, for the both of you? Um, what, what projects are you currently working on that we can, uh, that we can look forward to? Nicole? Uh, yeah, so the next book that uh, I've got coming out, really exciting. Um, so uh, Enemy Alien is out through Between the Lines, um, and my next book is going to be out through Between the Lines as well. Uh, we just heard back from them this last month. So uh, we're working with, so I work with my partner, Hugh Goldring. He's a script writer, and uh, our next project uh, is going to be working with a medical historian at the University of Saskatchewan, Dr. Erica Dick who has researched, among other things, uh, a history of uh, LSD research in Canada. Wow. So uh, we have a short comic, I think it's about the same length as Enemy Alien actually, um, about the history of the Weyburn Institute, which was a mental institution in a small town in Saskatchewan where LSD trials were taking place in the 1950s. Um, super cool history, uh, happened in the middle of nowhere, Saskatchewan, and it had um, uh, incredible effects all over the world in terms of uh, drug research and, uh, you know, counterculture and, um, you know, uh, what we're seeing today is a, a revival of scientific study of psychedelics. So uh, I'm not totally sure when that's coming out, but I'm going to say uh, early next year. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's what people have to look forward to. I'm also online all the time publishing things that are smaller than that and are just going around the internet. So uh, people can find my work on Twitter or Instagram or uh, Facebook. Well, I look forward to, uh, to receiving your book in, 
um, in my mailbox since it's it, Between the Lines is one of our favorite publishers and every year they, they submit several books for our Wilson Book Prize and um, you know, graphic novels are often uh, their nomination. And uh, Cass, for you, any future projects, things you're working on right now that we should look forward to? <laughs> um, so that's full steam ahead on that. Um, but I'm also working uh, on a few other things. I think the, the thing that's closest to completion is an, another uh, project on internment that I'm working on um, with Mikhail Bjorgi, who's an associate at the Wilson Institute. Um, so we're uh, coming out with a book with Athabasca University Press um, that deals with um, a camp guard in who um, who was a, a, a guard at both Fort Henry and Capus Casing. So that's coming out soon, uh, hopefully. Um, and in a dream world, I would be able to say that Nicole and I are working on something new. Uh, but hopefully that that happens one day soon. We'll work together again on something else. For both of you, we'll see you at a book launch when this pandemic is over, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. I mean, it'll be over at some point, right? <laughs> <laughs> What's going to happen first? The, me finishing my dissertation or COVID? <laughs> oh, I've got, I, you know, I, I, I've, you know, we, we don't give Corsini fellowships to, uh, you know, to not awesome people. Um, so I've got my money on, on cast. Dissertation before COVID ends? Ooh, yeah. I yeah. I'll <laughs> 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 well, get going on that. <laughs> All right. Well, again, thanks. Thanks both of you for, 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 you know, accepting to do this. I, I know it's really, really stressful times and it's, it's really, really difficult to get into like this, you know, like this, this, this mind frame when, when, when there's just so much, you know, like happening, you know, like outside of our walls. So I hope, you know, you're all well and stay safe and um, we'll have a celebratory drink um, when this pandemic is over. Yes. Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming.